hear Paul. So, without further ado, please welcome Paul Evans. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you George. So, so it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to be here, and I, uh, I was somewhat intimidated putting this talk together, because this is like speaking at home, so I sort of figured that this would be like when the kids uh, get home at the end of the day and you ask them what they did at school, and maybe you guys will be asking me what I did with all of your resources and, uh, and, and why I would take, your, take time to explain what we're doing. Uh, but I'd I really like to do that. I'm grateful that you came, and I'm really interested in sharing this and getting your perspectives on it. So what, what we are hoping to do is to talk about how to control uh, the, the dynamics of oxides, to understand and control the dynamics of oxides. And, uh, and I'd like to share with you some of the puzzles that come about in x-ray science from trying to do this mostly with, a hard, almost all with hard x-rays uh, in this talk. Okay, so I'm, we're interested in particular in classes of materials that have a built-in degree of order that uh, you think of as pharaohic. That means that if you look at not just where the atoms are, but at the distribution of other properties in the lattice or in the system, that, the, that there's a, something that has a long range order. And I'm, I'll spend a lot of time on what's, a, what's called a ferroelectric. These are materials that have, if you look inside the lattice, they have a built-in direction of the polarization, some aspect of that. But uh, they're members of a more general class. So for example, they're dielectrics. They're also, p all ferroelectrics are piezoelectric. They're pyroelectric, which means the polarization changes as a function of temperature. And ferroelectric, in principle, actually means that you can reverse the polarization. So we'll talk about this, uh, general, this, this general idea that these are functional ways to classify the materials and that maybe we should think about them in terms of functionality as well. And uh, in the, you think about these materials as being phases that you can access, meaning that they exist under the conditions that you can synthesize, then that they have a long range order and useful functional properties. Okay, so that's the, that's the general idea. If you wanted to think more about what these materials actually looked like, you would think about uh, maybe a prototypical ferroelectric or, or multiferroic is this material bismuth uh, iron oxide, bismuth ferrite or BFO. It is almost a cube. And so you can see that it has these atoms at the corners, it has oxygens in between, and it has an iron in the center. So bismuth, iron, and oxygen. The, each of these atoms is charged. And you can think about how you'd add this up. There's a, been a huge advance in understanding how to go from a structural model to understanding what the ferroelectric polarization is over the last, say, 20 years. And then you could say, well, why is it in this state and not in some other state? And what you'd do is the same way that you'd think about why water is a liquid at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, you could build a, a model of the free energy of this system. Okay, so this is that kind of model. And this is a model taken from a, a paper from uh, Pertsov. This is, this is a widely cited paper, but you can see here the free energy G then it depends on a whole bunch of terms. I don't know if you can read this or not, but you can see here it's got a polarization squared. It's got polarizations multiplied by other polarizations, and it goes out to at least, uh, at least uh, six orders in the polarization. So now if we want to change the polarization of this material, to change its phase, we just move it around on the landscape that's defined by all these polarizations or stresses here, the sigmas. And to do that, we, to do that, we can think about ways you, would, ways you would move this ferroelectric to another stable state. So if you apply a stress, you can say, is this new state the stable state under a changed stress? It's not necessarily clear that, that, that this state would be the one. In fact, it's not in the case of BFO. And how fast does it change? And how can we make that useful? Okay, ferromagnets, I won't say much about magnetic materials, but if you're a magnetic materials person, you can think about the same thing. This is a paper from 1998. This is a paper from 1946 by Charles Cattell, and it's how you predict what domains you find in magnetic materials, and it's the same model, okay? 
energy of the surface, energy of the boundaries, and you just add up the free energies. And if you perturb this balance, you can move to a new state. Everybody, everybody happy? All right, so that's what makes them so useful because if you perturb the balance, you can think about ways you can perturb the balance. In these ferroic and multiferroic oxides, this is a, uh, I forgot to copy the reference on here, it's from a, a paper by uh, Nicola Spalding and Manfred Feibig. You can, you can imagine that you have the polarization here and you can change it by applying an electric field or you can change the magnetization by applying a magnetic field H. You can change the strain by applying a stress, but you can also change the strain by changing the polarization and changing or around and around and around. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So the idea is that we can, we can work with these materials by changing the fields that they sit in, when we can, we can start to try to understand, well, what happens if I try to address what this coupling actually is, or this coupling, electric field to strain, or electric field to magnetization, and are there any others? So if you wanted to go and design and use these materials, this is, the la I think, the last of the introduction, uh, last of the, the general background slides, uh, if you want to design and use these materials, you can have a set of strategies. Remember that, that we had this idea that there was a, a free energy, and it was, we called it G, and there were coefficients, there was A, there was Q, and so on. You could have a situation where you decide on having new phases by trying to predict the values of A and search around, or for values of Q and so on. And you can, use, you can predict those new phases, you can change the composition, you can try to design structures that drive ferroelectricity, and there's been a huge set of advances in first principles theory using what's called the Berry phase to drive chemical design in these systems. You can also think about making new terms in the free energy that you didn't have before. And so if you have finite size effects, domains and domain boundaries, which weren't in that G that I gave you, uh, you can create nanoscale size effects and so on. And, uh, and this is beginning to be widely exploited. In fact, uh, APS has made huge contributions here, uh, dating to the work that uh, uh, um, Brian Stevenson and Dylan Fong and Steven Streifer did uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, I'd like to talk about a different approach, where well, you can make dynamic changes to the ferroelectricity by, per by asking what happens in response to uh, very fast perturbation. If it's successful, then you could think about where to use these materials. And we, in fact, use them all the time. Uh, in, and the, the key insight is that that free energy is a real energy. It's not just a means for predicting the phase, it's the same as moving between liquid and vapor phases in a refrigerator. You can build a refrigerator by changing the energy. Well, here, if you change the energy of a ferroic material, you can, you can make caloric materials by uh, examining how the, the temperature, how the heat capacity, uh, how the heat that you evolve uh, is, um, is coupled to the fields, and that is, those are caloric, and when you do it with a ferroelectric, it's called an electrocaloric material. You can make magnetocaloric materials as well. In optics, you can make nonlinear optics. In electronics, these things become, uh, can become ferroelectric memories, or FETs, or high-K dielectrics, and you can make mechanical actuators and sensors. So you can think about if you know how to move around on that free energy diagram to shift where it is using an applied field, then you can do things that are useful. So that was our motivation, uh, even though I won't show you anything, uh, anything nearly uh, as advanced in terms, of, in terms of ideas for applications. These are, um, these are in the backs of our minds. So the question that you come, if you come to the APS to think about is, is to realize that understanding the ferroelectric, the ferroelectricity of these materials is really a structural challenge because the ferroelectricity is intrinsically linked to the positions of all of these ions. You know the charges, the orbitals don't change very much. Most of the polarization, most of the functionality in that P is, comes from the positions. So if you knew the positions of the atoms, then you can develop a sense of where you are on that free energy diagram very easily. So the polarization, the key point is the polarization arises from the relative, relative position and maybe a little bit from the polarization of the atoms. So we want to know, uh, this is a, a 
hard x-ray question, where all the atoms are, and we want to know right then, right? Right when it happens. Okay, so we're going to, uh, I'm going to spend the remainder of this time, except for a little bit at the end, uh, talking about optically induced effects that can allow us to perturb where we sit on this free energy diagram. So optically induced effects are, have been around for, for some time. They're photovoltaic effects. And I want you to think of these as a new way for understanding the physics of the ferroelectrics and multiferroelectrics, and think of it as new methods maybe for controlling their functionalities. And there are lots of photovoltaic effects. You could imagine making photo actuators, rewritable electronics, and so on. And some examples here, this is a, 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 a relatively recent paper ex, a, uh, demonstrating that there's a photovoltaic effect. If you create a biased structure, you illuminate a ferroelectric, you can have a current that uh, gets swept out. And in some sense, it's like a polar wideband gap semiconductor. In other senses, you might imagine that you're actually changing the properties of the ferroelectric. So you want to think about this general set of ideas and maybe ask, well, there's no, there's no, the, this is actually uh, a challenging problem because the optical effects don't show up in that G, right? So the question is, where do we, how do we start to think about what's happening optically in these systems when we, when we don't, we can't just change the free energy? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to talk about two, uh, two types of studies and two types of approaches. One is that you can uh, uh, explore these phases. I'll call, I'll, I'll, I'll try to avoid this word in the future, but I, you can think about these as uh, states that you reach after you uh, drive the system optically and you think about them maybe as being metastable and where the structural parameters change or you can even drive the material between phases. This is a plot of the phase diagram of this BFO as a function of the strain with respect to its substrate and you can see that the, the, the C over A ratio and the tetragonality changes as a function of strain and it has a transition here at this particular value of compressive strain. And the question is, this is the equilibrium phase diagram. How do we move around on that phase diagram? And can we do it optically? Okay, so we have competing phases and a systematic variation of the structural uh, parameters. And ultimately, you're thinking about exciting things about how to control the properties. Okay, so here's the outline, uh, what I'll do with the, the, remaining, the remaining time. I'll talk about uh, the dynamics of a particular set of, of structural features, polarization features, in uh, uh, an exciting uh, optical, optically pumped system in uh, lead titanate, strontium titanate super lattices. I'll talk about phase transformations in this multiferroic BFO. And I'll talk at the very end about pushing towards studies that involve studying the magnetic order in these systems instead of just the uh, ferroelectric order. Okay, so let's imagine now a thought experiment where you have a ferroelectric material. It's in a state that you understand, and you have a, a very uh, short optical pulse above, of above band gap radiation. And the question is, what happens to the system so that we can start to think about, about the, uh, the distortion that's going to arise and uh, what's going to happen. So this is t equals zero here, and this pulse is uh, drawn in blue because the band gaps of most of these ferroelectric materials are around three volts. Then uh, in, uh, there's a, a set of uh, phenomena here, and you can start to think about where they might be, where they might be possible, it might be possible to probe them, but you have an electronic effect that happens very fast, and a promotion of carriers from the ground state to the excited state, that happens very fast during the optical pulse, and maybe within a few picoseconds, the carriers are thermalized. Then up to about 100 picoseconds, the whatever perturbation to the ground state that you've delivered electronically has to be reflected by a change in the positions of the atoms and the strain and the polarization. And that happens, and you can think of that as an acoustic effect, and that happens up to about 100 picoseconds. Then at some later time, there's a, a effect linked to carrier recombination. And maybe at much longer times, there's all the stuff that is associated with recovering to the ground state. And so there's things like if your ferroelectric's not perfect and you have uh, dangling bonds, maybe you can trap some charges, and so on. Okay, so these are, I'll, I'll tell you first about a set of experiments that uh, 
that uh, we participated in with Haidan Wen here at the APS. And the key is that the the key is that you can start to think about these by looking at a, by looking at a uh, diffraction pattern that tells you about the positions of the atoms, but do this uh, in, a, in a way that's time resolved. So let's take the, take the APS, you just count the, figure out when the pulses arrive, and uh, you can make a, a tightly focused beam. Uh, we used a beam of about 11 uh, kilovolts in this case. Uh, you've got about 100 picosecond time resolution. And then you pump the sample with a laser and you look at the spot where the, they coincide. And, uh, and then the question is, what happens to, the, what happens to this system? And can we, can we reach states that we couldn't reach before? So I'll tell you, the first, the first of these sets of experiments involved uh, a system that is at a, at a very sensitive boundary in its configuration already. So now we've, we can use this as a way to detect a small change induced by optical effects. And so here, this is a system, this is a ferroelectric material, lead titanate, that's in a, in a epitaxial stack with a, material, with a, a dielectric material, strontium titanate. So it's a lead titanate, strontium titanate super lattice. And if you can see the difference between the gray and the white here, you can see that there's about in this case, about 10 layers of lead titanate, a few layers of strontium titanate, and it goes on. And so uh, if, you, if you build this by epitaxial growth, it, it can't choose the polarization uniquely. It has a problem, and there's no atomic scale configuration that wins. In fact, it organizes itself into a pattern where some of this layer has the polarization pointing up, and some of, it, uh, some of it points down. And it does that and in a way that minimizes the total polarization and also minimizes the domain wall energy. And that chooses a length scale of about uh, three nanometers for the width of these domains. Everybody see that? So if you look at this system, if you just grew this and cool it off, you'd find that it was patterning itself at three, at, uh, three nanometer periodicity. So the question is, how does this domain degree of freedom change the structure and the dynamics, and how does the nanoscale order emerge, or how, does it, how can it be um, manipulated? Okay, so this is what it looks like if you do an X-ray scattering experiment at the APS. If you go, this was, this was from our, our first set of studies of this system uh, a long time ago with uh, Pisa Chen, who's here. And what PISA found was that there's, a, there's the typical structural reflections here. So this is the super lattice. This is its bottom electrode. These blobs on the side are the diffuse scattering from the domain structure. So you just, it's just like if you had a diffraction grating, you would produce lines from a diffraction grating. These domains are forming a diffraction grating, except in this case, the diffraction grating is not a set of parallel lines, it's a set of it's kind of snaky lines, as I'll show you in a second. And so you get rings like this. And so this is, the, this is a map that shows you the ring goes all the way around and that the ring appears around each super lattice reflection. Uh, if we've, we've studied this extensively. It's such a wonderful model system for lots of things. With Stefan Herskowitz, we, um, we looked at some ideas for X-ray imaging uh, using tychography. And if you think about what would match the statistics of what I just showed you, this is the type of thing you'd see in the domain pattern. But it exists only because the domains and the polarization are exactly traded off. If we change that balance a little bit, it will go to a new state, and we can ask how long it takes to get there, what the new states are, and what the properties are. OK, so let's do an experiment where we pump this optically and see if we can reach a state that's different. This is a, this, um, I'm sorry, this, uh, this uses a slightly different optical pump than I just described. This is with 355 nanometers. Um, and, and what we do is we pump it. In fact, we're going to pump it here. Okay, this is what it looks like. If you just drive a, X, a focused X-ray beam in a nano diffraction experiment across the surface, and you see that, that it has some variation, that's because the structure is slightly different. This isn't a perfect epitaxial film. And you turn on the laser, and you get a hole in the diffraction pattern not a hole in the diffraction pattern, but a hole in the, in the real space image of the scattering, that's where the optical beam is. And so the, here the domains 
here there's no domains where the light is on. Everybody see that? If you look at the diffraction pattern, here's the diffraction pattern I just showed you, and the domains are gone. Okay. So that is an optically induced transformation in this super lattice, and it actually, you can see the super lattice reflection actually shifts as well. So what we've done is change the boundary conditions in that free energy so that it's not, the domains aren't the stable state anymore. The domain, now the system prefers to be in the, uh, in the state that has no domains. And so you might ask, now, how does it get from here to there, and what is going on in this state? That state is new because it doesn't exist in the ground state. It's the, it's the optically excited uh, state. Okay, so this happened, this was uh, something we reported a, a, a while ago. And this actually, if we look carefully, I'm gonna skip this slide because I just showed you, and I'm gonna skip this one. And I'm gonna skip this except to show you that this really exists from a diffraction perspective. The laser off is in this blue. If you turn on the laser, then it shifts. And it, uh, the peak shifts and the, this is the plot of the domain intensity for different lasers. The domains are, up, are here, up high when the laser is off, and down low and almost gone when the laser is on. So the, the, the domains go away. And uh, then you could say, well, I think you would say, what if you're just heating it up? So if, you're, if you heat it, the domains also go away because you get close to the phase transformation. This goes, this is the TC uh, of the film. The lattice actually, though, contracts. So here's the domains going away as you heat it. Here's the lattice, but the lattice contracts. The optically induced effect causes the lattice to expand. So this isn't just changing the temperature. This is changing something about the way the polarization works inside the ferroelectric. So that's kind of fun. And that, that, was, that motivated us. This is um, the, the exciting part. Here's the depressing part. This is time. And you're going to see this is seconds. So what's happening here is that whatever happens, it happens pretty fast at the beginning, and it takes a long time to recover. So we think that this effect is, as a, we have, and we have a little bit of other evidence for this, we think that this effect is linked to a polarization screening effect driven by the carriers that are excited optically and then trapped. And so we have some evidence that, that that's the case and that this effect in the domain transformation is linked to excitation and then trapping of charge. So let me show you how that would work. If you build a, if you build a, a model, this is the free energy. This is the G I showed you before. And I'm going to introduce a new parameter, which is basically the screening. It's how far does the polarization reach? And if you change the polarization, uh, how far this polarization is screened, you can, you can uh, make a plot of what it would be the free energy in the monodomain system, the free energy in the polydomain uh, system, the, the case where it's the free energy versus screening efficiency for the polydomain is flat, the screen energy versus the screening efficiency for the monodomain dives down because it, the screening makes that configuration more viable. And then the system, when you get to a high screening efficiency, the system transforms, the monodomain becomes stable, and the system goes into the monodomain state. So here, the optical excitation is changing the screening of the polarization and driving the system in a free energy through a system that's lower free energy. This would be like making liquid water stable at minus 10 C, right? You change the rules for how the waters interact, and all of a sudden, then the, then the system prefers a different ground state. Okay. So I have some, some words here about, uh, about this, this is, but the, the basic thing you should keep in mind is that we understand basically what's going on, but it's a depressingly long time scale. We'd like to know what the initial state is. What is the happening to this optical, what is happening during this optical excitation that eventually drives the system to the new ground state? And for that, if you look carefully at many of these systems, and I'll come back to this when we talk about the, BF, the bismuth ferrite in a little bit, that for that, the APS time resolution is just not quite, it's not enough because the, the acoustic effects that are associated with the, following the absorption of the, of the light happen, they propagate about the speed of sound. The speed of sound is on the order of kilometers per second. If a film is 30 or 40 nanometers thick, then you only have tens of picoseconds to work with after the optical excitation. 
So the optics, the optical effects, the acoustic effects happen very fast, and you can't see them here, but you can see them at a free electron laser. So these are, these are some of the people here. This is Sam Marks, he's here. These are um, uh, guys doing, our guys doing an experiment in Pohong at their free electron laser last, uh, last spring. And this is, uh, this is the, what the FEL looks like, and you sit down here, right? And it has a 10 GeV electron beam. It makes, uh, in this case, 9.7 kilovolt X-ray pulses. They're uh, below 100 femtoseconds, something like 50 femtoseconds, and a rep rate of 30 hertz. So it's going tick, 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 tick. And you measure that we have a total flux about equal to the storage ring, and you just remember that you can do almost everything you do at the APS as long as, long as you can live with uh, 30 hertz. So it's, it's really a beautiful machine. Uh, they can do the same experiment, and we'll now just take this super lattice thin film and the strontium ruthenate electrode that it sits on. This is, becomes important in just a second. We'll have the femtosecond X-ray pulse, and we'll uh, have a femtosecond optical pulse. And now it really does matter that we have a femtosecond optical pulse because we have to synchronize it. So let's see what it looks like. This is what a diffraction pattern looks like when you do that. So before I showed you that it was seconds, right? Here it's picoseconds, and you're gonna take, I want you to, I wanna point out uh, a couple of things. The first one is, uh, this is the Bragg peak here. So this is two theta, it's increasing, so higher Q is up here. This is the Bragg peak, and if you look really carefully, can you see that you can't, maybe you can see this, maybe you can't. You can see that it's actually it's a little bit lower angle here. There's some expansion in 50 picoseconds, okay, 60 picoseconds. And then you see all this crazy stuff. These, uh, this is the acoustic pulse going through the super lattice, and I'll tell you more about it in just a second. The acoustics are, are a little bit unusual because you can see here it's compressing the sample. There the acoustic pulse expands, and then it's done. The domain diffuse scattering, we'll talk more about this in a second as well, has a big transient because not only are you changing the lattice parameter, you're also changing the positions of the atoms and the, and the uh, intensity of the domain diffuse scatter. Okay, so let's, everybody get this? this? This is sort of imprinted in your mind. The idea is in picoseconds, you see the acoustics go by. And then maybe after that, you start to see what you did to the lattice. Maybe in here, this is happening as well, but we can't see it yet. All right, in this particular system, there's, uh, there's two things that are happening. I have some big words here. You have an impulse that propagates from the top surface and you have a contraction that propagates from the bottom electrode. So the bottom electrode's down here. It is, a, it is like a metal. And so it absorbs very, very, very strongly, and it expands very fast. It pushes on the film, and it launches an acoustic pulse that goes up. Then whatever the optical pulse is doing to the ferroelectric is expanding a narrow range near the surface, and that acoustic pulse propagates down. And when you simulate both of those together, you get this, which looks just like this, except that I've plotted it on a different uh, time scale, sadly, for you. So you can see this, this initial compression, expansion, and so on. You can actually see now that these things are there. Can you see these fringes here? Uh, can anybody count the fringes? If you look at the top, there's like seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, out of 10. Same thing here, right? That's because, well, we'll come back to that in just a second. This, this matches. This, what's happening here is that the acoustic pulse from the bottom electrode is propagating up at the speed of sound. It gets to the top of the 100 nanometer film in just under 30 picoseconds. It reflects from the top, like, like the echo off the wall. It has to reverse the sign, because you can't propagate the energy out of the film reverses the sign and comes back through and then out when it gets back to the bottom. Okay, and if you compare the, like say the maximum, the maximum, the wave vector of the maximum intensity versus what you see in the, for the experiment and the, and the simulation, you get pretty good agreement. So that acoustic model works and one plus two here, if you can see that, uh, just indicates that we have to take into account both sources of the pulse. Okay. So that's the acoustic simulation. Now, if you count those fringes, you can be suspicious that there's something systematic going on here. Let's count the fringes at the top and at the bottom, and you see that they're both very oscillating very fast and that the one in the middle oscillates very slowly. 
So if we Fourier transform this image in time as a function of Q, so here's Q versus the angular frequency. You can see here that the angular frequency of these, the oscillation of these fringes depends on Q, and you get a line that propagates out. You see that? Okay, so if you look at that, that is the acoustic phonon dispersion in the ferroelectric. Because anytime you have an acoustic effect, you Fourier transform it versus Q, you'll get this acoustic phonon dispersion. That goes way out, and way up here near the ceiling, there will be the optical phonons. We just can't see those because we don't have, we don't have five femtosecond time resolution at the FEL. Okay, so that's that. And you say, well, that's not very interesting, Paul, because this is just a, this is just an acoustic phonon dispersion. Well, I'll show you, I'll show you in a second. It gets, it gets, that gets interesting as well. Um, so we went, we, you can do this, you can fit it, and you get a, a speed of sound of 3,400 uh, meters per second. There's already a little bit of a surprise there because if you uh, predict the longitudinal acoustic velocity for systems like this using a, uh, using a, um, a simple uh, composite model, you get the wrong speed of sound. So this, this is already information, and we, we think it has to do with how things are bonded at the interface. All right, so we went back and we did this again, like you do, like you do uh, other experiments with the dynamics, uh, and, and we did, saw this. So this is the, uh, not the Bragg peak anymore, this is the first order uh, reflection from the super lattice, but you can think of it like a Bragg peak in a way. And you can see it's got a very slow oscillation. But if you look carefully, can you see these fringes here? See those? Are they doing the same or the opposite from before? So you look at the period of these guys. These are fringes, and they're getting more widely spaced as you go further away from the zone center. Can you see that? So let's Fourier transform that and we get a different kind of dispersion, okay? So before you transform this guy, this actually is a pretty fast oscillation. This is uh, 700 gigahertz out here. Well, that's pretty fast. If you before you transform that, oops, my, I don't know why it's rendering this uh, with an R in the wrong place. Before you transform this, if we look at this place here, this is where we are. Before we saw this uh, angular frequency versus wave vector looked like that. Now we see the angular frequency versus wave vector here. We see the the green, which is the acoustic dispersion, plus we see a high frequency that's up here. That's the folded phonon mode that comes from the zone center of the, uh, the new zone center of this mini, Bru mini Bruan zone that arises because of the super lattice. So you get all this interesting acoustic stuff that happens because of the structure of the medium that you've manipulated in the ferroelectrics. So the X-ray scattering gives you a way to start to see the, the Acoustic. So those are called folded phonon modes, and they'll appear in all of the ultra-fast thin film diffraction uh, uh, patterns that you see with, the, with this kind of time resolution. If you look at things that are structured, you'll get folded phonons. Okay. Uh, now the question, we, I, I, the question I advertised was that maybe we should think about what happens to the domains on this time scale. What happens to the polarization? All this acoustic stuff is happening. All the... the the, all the atoms and all the modes are responding acoustically. The question is, what happened to these domains when you, when you pump it optically? So I'm going to take this plot we saw before. This is the plot that shows you where the domains are in reciprocal space. This is the, uh, this is the uh, Bragg peak for the super lattice there. Here's the ring of domain diffuse scattering. They're going to show up here. This is the T less than zero. This is data acquired at the FEL now. Here's the Bragg peak. Here are the domains. And this is the same range at about 60 picoseconds. This is because this is actually plotted in a little bit misleading way. This comes in because the rod, is, the rod of intensity along this thin film has moved onto the detector a little bit. But you can see here that the domains have shifted because there's some strain. They've shifted to lower Q, and they've changed their intensity. So that's interesting because it's so hard to imagine that a domain pattern would be transformed to a uniform polarization in only 50 picoseconds. And so we should think about structurally what's happening to this ferroelectric polarization uh, during this time. So here's, the, here's the, uh, the domain diffuse scattering plotted as a function of time. 
So intensity versus time for the domain diffuse scattering. And it goes out. This is now a really long time is 140 picoseconds for the FEL. So if you sat out here, you'd see this is the first point you'd see with the APS. And the first point we did see with the APS. And there's not much change. In here, there's a structural change that's happening to the domains uh, as the acoustic pulse goes through. And then as you see after, you can see that there's a small change in intensity uh, once the acoustic pulse is done due to the change in polarization that responds to the, responds to the small transient expansion that we saw. OK, so this, this tiny figure shows you that if you take a, mo a model of this system and you, put, you say, well, what would have to happen to the structure of my super lattice if I change the polarization uh, in, in each layer to make that change in intensity happen. Here's, our, uh, here's where we started. And that we'll just call that the fraction of the polarization it originally had. We'll call it 1 and 1. And if it goes down, if we wanted to make the change, the strain and the intensity change the way that we see it, it would have to go to a situation where all of the polarization is in the lead titanate and none is in the strontium titanate. So that what's happening in this structural model that seems to fit the data is that the screening happens really fast. The strontium titanate polarization goes to almost zero where it wants to be. The lead titanate polarization increases, and you can have a discontinuity because you have all these electrons and holes in the system. That's what we deduce from this, this diffraction pattern um, that we can see in a few picoseconds. That's the state that then eventually has to wait for all the kinetics of the domain motion to transform into the, do the transformation that we saw. OK, so that's, the, that's, the, um, that's what's happening in these super lattice systems and how the optical effect eventually leads to the transformation. So the model that comes out of this is that you pump the system very hard, you have a screening, there's a rapid and somewhat unimportant acoustic phenomenon. The acoustic pulse rattles around and then leaves the system. And then what's left over is some screening that changes the polarization. And then the, then the ferroelectric waits and waits and waits and waits for the domains to work out how to get out of the system. OK, so that's the, that was the first of these. The second, I'm going to go a little faster, of course. But the second is, the second area I want to talk about was how to think about phase transformations in this uh, multiferroic uh, bismuth ferrite. And, uh, and this is interesting because now we can not only drive the domains away, but the question is, uh, can we drive the system to prefer a totally different structural phase by uh, these optically induced effects? And so I think I, think, uh, I can show you we've done that. And uh, let, me just, let me just tell you a little bit about the landscape around this, this uh, fascinating material first. So the, these are, uh, this is uh, the structure of bismuth ferrite. And these are different structural parameters. At the very beginning of the talk, I showed you this plot of the C over A ratio. That's how tall the unit cell is over how wide it is and the tetragonality. And you can see that here that jumps when the, when the, strain, that, uh, the strain with respect to the substrate that you're growing on reaches this critical value around minus 4%. And all of the other properties simultaneously change, OK? So the polarization, the iron oxygen distance, uh, the unit cell volume, and so on, everything changes right here. And the historical approach is that you sit, you can choose which phase you want. And the way you choose that is you take, out of, take from the shelf, you pick what substrate you're going to grow the material on. Now the question is, can we go from here to here and how fast and what drives it. So if we start here on this side of the phase transformation, can we get to that side? OK, so we can expect that strain or doping could yield this transition, but we don't know what the dynamics would be. And we expect that it could be as fast as the speed of sound if we could drive it hard enough. We know that electrically we can drive that transformation. And we have a model for doing that. We studied that um, uh, a couple of years ago. But the question is, can we drive it optically? So here we come back. This time, um, this time, the experiment will match this slide. And we'll, we'll pump this thing optically. And then we'll have this model okay, that's very similar to the model we had before. We'll have uh, an op optical excitation. We generate some charge. We, have the, uh, we, have the, we screen the polarization 
or the depolarization field, and then the field uh, leads to a change in the polarization. Actually, this should be a P and not an E. Oop, that's cool. Okay, Q Park put that animation in for me. Let's plot what we might have to ha expect to happen if we do this. So here we'll plot again the energy. This is a calculation from Serge Nachmanson at the University of Connecticut. A plot the free energy in, um, as a function of the c-axis lattice parameter for the two relevant phases. He's going to call them MR and MT. I'm going to drop the M and I'm just going to call them R and T in just a second. So here's the free energy. Here's the, the out of plane lattice parameter. And you can see this is the green is the R and the blue is the T. And we see the important difference here is that the T is softer than the R. Right? So if I expand it a little bit, this, this expansion that I'm going to expect from the ferroelectrics, the relative free energy is going to favor, let's take each one. We'll throw them to their equilibrium. This guy and this guy will choose them so they're the same free energy. We move them each 0.1 angstroms higher, and the energy for the R phase goes up more. So we expect that we expand this material, then the, we'll favor the T and the T will expand, the R will contract. Okay, or the R will disappear. The T will, the both of them expand in the lattice parameter, the region, the amount covered by the, the amount of the sample in the, in the R phase will decrease and the T phase will increase. What happens in BFO is similar to what happens in, in lead titanate, uh, and lead titanate, strontium titanate super lattice, if there's an optical pulse, Haidan Wen showed this, uh, and then um, it was followed up in a paper that uh, he collaborated on, we collaborated on, uh, in, just a year later that does it much faster. In both of these, you can see that if you pump at time t equals zero, there's a rapid expansion, and that the expansion is basically over in about 10 picoseconds. This one was at a, a, a pulse laser source, a laboratory pulse laser source in Berlin. This one was at the APS, so it's a little bit lower, uh, a little bit uh, less uh, uh, precise time resolution. But you see in both cases there's a rapid expansion that's over really fast. So that's what's going to happen. We'll pump the BFO and expands. Then you can go back to this model we have. We've expanded all the phases, and now the phase that has the lowest free energy wins, the, that one we expect to be the tetragonal phase. Everybody happy? That, uh, that is interesting. The problem is BFO expands when you heat it. So we should keep that in mind. That's why I didn't show it first. BFO expands when you heat it, so you have to be aware that maybe there's a little thermal contribution in here someplace. Okay, here's the photo-induced strain. So you just pump BFO above band gap, and it shifts to a lower lattice parameter. Uh, here's what happens in the mixed phase. So this is the expansion of the T phase lattice parameter. This is the delay time in nanoseconds. So this is a, the measurement at the APS. You can see that here we pump it at T equals zero. It expands, and then it expands some more, and then it contracts. So this part, we understand. That's the electronic effect going away, the little carrier recombination. This it seems a little slow, right? Like, didn't I just tell you that eight picoseconds was how long it took to expand, and now it's going to take a nanosecond to expand? A little weird. Um, let's look at the increase in the diffracted intensity, or the change in diffracted intensity. So here's the T phase. And it goes up, and over about a nanosecond, the T phase increases and then decreases. The, the two competing phases, this is the R phase, I guess it's TR phase, but R, really R phase in our calculation, it goes down. This is a part of the T phase that has to appear with the R phase, it goes down as well. So the, here, what we're having, what we're seeing is that the T phase wins, the R phase loses, and then they both come back to equilibrium over several nanoseconds. You see that? So it's optically induced, rapid phase transformation. This piece is a little puzzling, right? Because why should it keep expanding? And what we linked this to was the idea that much of the film is clamped near the boundaries of the, of the R phase, and so what happens is that it continues to expand a little bit as the transformation happens. Okay, so uh, here's what happens with fluents. And what happens is that as the, if you increase the optical fluence, the, the amount that's transformed increases. And you can get this to the point where uh, about 30% of the, T, the tilted T and tilted R phases, at least in some of the domains, 
have, have, di have disappeared and that the, that the T phase has increased. So 15% of the sample, 15 to 30%, depending on how you count it, has transformed because of this one optical pulse in about a nanosecond. That's a, just an optically induced transformation towards the T-like. Okay. Uh, so that was where things stood uh, two weeks ago. And if I've, if I've been here earlier in the semester, earlier in the summer or earlier in the year, uh, that's what I where I would have stopped. And I would have said, this is, this is, our model is what I showed you, that the T phase and the R phase both expand and one wins. But, you, but when we went, um, then we can look at this, uh, we just looked at this with the free electron laser. So I'm going to, in the last five minutes, show you data that's only a week old from one of the FELs. This is from an experiment in Japan. And if you, can, if you go to the, uh, if you look at this tilted T-like reflection or the T-like reflection, this is basically raw data. So it, sadly, the, it didn't even get copied over with the, bra that, that's the Bragg angle. But if you look carefully, it's, they're both shifting, they're both expanding, and they're both doing it in 10 picoseconds, which makes a lot of sense, right? That's the rapid optically induced expansion that we expect. And then much later, there's a transformation. So here's the transition, the initial transition after the, the excitation to the state that we can't see at the APS because it exists in that few hundred picoseconds where everything's changing and it's, and it's hard to disentangle. And, uh, and this is what's driving the transformation. This little bit of expansion now makes this phase and this phase um, energetically more favorable. Okay. Uh, Oops, I have another copy of that, sorry. Uh, and then that brings me to the last, well, to the, to almost to the end, except uh, I wanted to make the point that we're at kind of an exciting time at the, in doing these experiments because it's possible to go back and start to think about what you could do if you would have 100 times more x-ray flux, which like you're about to get, right? Or at least 100 times more focused x-ray flux. And so what, what we thought might be interesting is to think about if we, you might remember at the very beginning, I showed you a map of the, the ferroelectric domain population as a function of position. Everybody remember that? And then I said, let's make that time resolved. And we did. And the reason, was, the reason we could do that is that we have enough intensity that you can afford to divide the APS by whatever the repetition rate of the laser is with respect to the pulse rate. So we have a six megahertz rep rate, whoops, wrong way, we have a six megahertz rep rate for the APS and a one kilohertz rep rate for the laser, all of your signal is divided by a factor of 6,000, right? Everybody happy with that? So the question is, could we afford to divide any other signals by 6,000 and look at their time domain signatures or start to look at how things evolve and one of the things that is fascinating to me is that it's not been possible to do the same level of precise experiment with magnetic materials, to look at the coupling of magnetism to the structure of, of materials because the, because the experiments have been too hard or just, just, um, just out of reach. And so I'm going to show you uh, some, some experiments that make, me, make us think that it's going to be possible when you're done with your upgrade to start to think about the same types of studies in magnetic materials and start to think about what the magnetic excitations are and how magnetic transformations work and so on, and using hard x-rays and, um, and complement many of the beautiful soft x-ray methods that are available for that. So I'm gonna talk about a material that exhibits, a material called gadolinium iron garnet. It's not super important uh, uh, that you remember all the details of it, except that it has a lot of gadoliniums in it. So George will recognize that where we're going. Uh, it has a lot of gadolinium and it's a very beautifully epitaxial crystal. So very narrow rocking curves, very intense x-ray reflections. It's a material that's of interest because it, it, it at an interface with a heavy metal like platinum exhibits something called the spin Sebeck effect, which has uh, interesting potential energy applications. And it has some puzzles, including if you look at the spin Sebeck effect voltage here as a function of magnetic field, you can see there's some hysteresis in the spin Sebeck effect. And that means that the spin Sebeck effect is likely linked to whatever's changing at these magnetic fields. And that's the magnetic domain pattern, which is unknown in, in these samples. 
So let's go and find out. This is what a nanobeam X-ray magnetic scattering experiment looks like. This was done at the ESRF. Uh, and this is that, you see the structure here? This is a copy of, this is a simpler version of that structure I just showed you. There's the, there's the uh, hull bar and this are the leads that come up to it. You can't see the one micron leads. We're gonna look at that pad right there. Okay. And so if we look at that pad, here's an optical micrograph. This is the total diffracted intensity and you see nothing. This is what's called the circular magnetic flipping ratio mapped out for that area. So you take circular right polarization, circular left polarization, you subtract the intensities of the two, and it shows you a map of a particular set of magnetic domains. The domain structure is a little complicated. I'll explain it in a second, but you can see that. Now, this contrast, if you can see from the back, this is the circular magnetic contrast. This is 1%. So to measure a 1% signal, you need tens of thousands of counts. This thin film only produces 50,000 counts per second. So this was like you know, a second per point, or two seconds per point. So it's totally impossible to go and divide that by 6,000, right? Uh, but if you get another factor of 100 and design the experiment correctly, maybe it's, maybe it's reasonable. So here's a, the, the origin of the magnetic contrast. This is the right and the left polarization just drawn out for you. This is a map of the same region at different photon energies, 7.932, 7.934, and so on. You can see the same feature here looking dark that looks bright here, and that's just sweeping through the, the resonant energy. And the contrast depends on the, on the energy so that you can, if you map out that, the difference between this and that area versus, versus energy, you get these points, and you plot that versus a prediction of what the magnetic scattering should be uh, by Yves Jolie in Grenoble, and you get, uh, you get this predicted curve here. And so these, this is really a map of the magnetism in this small area. In fact, it's a map of the projection of the magnetism onto the direction along the beam or uh, uh, backwards, this sort of in the scattering plane. So it, this is already possible. This is at ESRF. In fact, we can keep going. So this is, this is a map. And, Here's a map, that, again, of a different area. So you recognize the corner of that region I just showed you, the pad. This is three different levels, and so this will be backwards, forwards, and up or down there, we think. Uh, the domain pattern extends to the micron scale, and uh, this is a map of five microns, one micron, the same region. You can see there's a domain boundary there. They look like they're faceted. We think that this might be a 110. That's an 010 because it's parallel to the edge, and these are 010 edges. This looks like it might be a 310, a 100 there maybe. So we're trying to, this is, this is clearly uh, just being, this is clearly a new world for us. And the questions are, as you go forward now, what happens to this as a function of strain and what happens to this as a function of, say, optical excitation, changes in temperature, how do the magnetic excitations arise and so on. So this is, this is uh, all tantalizing now, but out of reach because the factor of a the factor of, uh, of many thousand that you need, or several thousand that you need to make this a time-resolved experiment uh, is not yet available. Okay, so that's, the, that's about the end. Uh, let me just remind you there were three things I wanted to talk about uh, that we talked about the striped domains and their dynamics and that the optically induced dynamics are complicated at the picosecond scale but ultimately give you a picture that tells you about this transformation, that there's this R to T transformation and we can drive that optically, and that there's some hope, I guess I said magnetism now accessible here, I probably should say magnetism with some more, uh, more uh, words in the middle, magnetism may become accessible once you guys complete your uh, beautiful upgrade. There are lots of people who work, oops, lots of people who work very hard on this, uh, and I'd just like to highlight uh, uh, these guys, uh, Jun Kyu Park, Young Jun An, and uh, uh, Hyun Jun Lee, along with lots of other collaborators um, and uh, people at the light sources around the world. And with that, I'll um, say thanks again for the invitation and be happy to take any questions. Uh-oh.
Right. Oh yeah, yeah. So the pre it is a pre it, it, you can think of it as a a large uniaxial stress. So would you do the same experiment with reapplying pressure? Oh, with a with a I don't think I think you, it, I think actually that's a great that's a great question. And so for many years, that's how you would discover these phases: is you'd adjust, you'd do a high pressure experiment and you'd study uh, how what the phase progression was as a function of pressure. If I go back. Um, you could also, a, a, a beautiful, a, one way to think about this type of experiment with, with uh, this, oh, this is a calculation, but this, this type of thing is if you plot the C over A ratio as a function of strain, you could just recalibrate that in terms of pressure if you want. And, uh, and so this is like a pressure phase diagram except that it's a, it's a biaxial stress because that reflects the experimental condition. Yeah, so I don't think, I don't know if, the, if anybody's ever tried to grind up one of these materials and do a, um, uh, do a, um, a hydrostatic pressure experiment. It might be interesting to think about. Make a powder out of the film and see if the domain pattern changes. Uh, but the principle you could do is also with laser by turning around and saying you don't want to excite your material laser, you only want to excite and just launch it, uh, do it, view it as an acoustic pulse like the, like, for example, you would in a, the, um, a, 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 a pulse high pressure experiment. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great idea. I have a question. Paul. Yes. So you, you showed in the beginning uh, the domain structure that has sort of a wiggly yes. structure. So what drives the periodicity of uh, oh. structure? That's a, that, is, that is the same thing as you would think about driving the periodicity of the, of the magnetic domain structures. What happens is that if you, um, if you try to make something that has a uniform polarization, it has to, and, a, and very thin, then it has a tremendous shape anisotropy. It does not want, things in general, you don't want to have to create a magnetic field in all of space. That costs you like the square of the field. And so if you can, make half of your sample point in the other direction, then you reduce that field. And the length scale changes as a function of, the length scale over which the field changes, uh, the field propagates depends on how, the periodicity of those domains. And as the domain pattern gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you polarize less of the world, less of the universe, but you have to pay for more domain walls. And so it's the balance of the domain wall energy and the depolarization energy that, that sets. This was something that Brian and Dylan uh, tested in the year 2000 in a beautiful set of experiments. If you screw up the surface, then you screen the, one reason you use the super lattices is if you screw up the surface and let stuff get on the surfaces, then you, then you don't need to screen the electric field and the domains go away. Thank you.